In this video, I'm going to explain what's meant by entropy. And by entropy here, I'm going to be discussing the information theoretic concept of entropy, rather than that coming from thermodynamics or statistical mechanics, although obviously these concepts are related to one another. So the mathematical form of entropy, which we often denote by H, is just given by for a discrete random variable, the sum over all potential x values of p of x times log of p of x, where p of x is some probability distribution. And the log, which I'm indicating here, is often for discrete random variables given by the log to the base 2, although it doesn't really change anything if you make it log to the base e, the formula still kind of works as you would expect it to. And in this video, I'm going to discuss two interpretations of entropy. And the first of those is going to be as a measure of oh, measure of uncertainty. So if you have a higher amount of entropy, there is more uncertainty in the system. And the second interpretation is as a measure of information content. And finally, after we've discussed these two interpretations of entropy, we're going to discuss why it makes intuitive sense, why this particular mathematical formula for entropy is sensible. And the example that I'm going to use to discuss entropy is that which I've used a lot before. It's just that concerning the flipping of a coin. And we're going to suppose that theta represents the probability of that coin landing heads up. And the random variable x is equal to zero if the result of that flip is a tails. And it's one if the coin lands heads up. So now we can use our formula for entropy to calculate the entropy of a coin flip. And I've noticed that actually by mistake, I forgot to write a minus sign in front of the expression for the entropy here. So we can work out the entropy of our coin flip example by just having minus times the probability that x is equal to zero, in other words, one minus theta, times the log of that probability, so the log of one minus theta, plus then the probability that x is equal to 1, in other words, just theta, times the log of that probability, theta. So what does this function for entropy actually look like? Well, we can graph it between the bounds of theta being 1 and 0. But what particular shape does this take? It's a bit hard to imagine what this function looks like. So to try and get a feel for what this function looks like, we're going to determine if it has any turning points. So to work out if it has any turning points, we're just going to differentiate the entropy function with respect to theta. And if we do so, we're going to get a minus times the first bracket just gives us minus one minus theta over one minus theta. Implicitly, I'm using the product rule here. And then the second part of the first term is when we differentiate the first part of the expression and hold the log part constant. So then we just get minus log 1 minus theta. And then moving on to the second bit, we first of all differentiate the log of theta. So we just get theta over theta plus theta over theta. And then we get minus log theta. And obviously the 1 minus theta over 1 minus theta is just 1. And we have a minus sign out the front, so it's minus 1. And then we've got theta over theta, which is just plus 1. So those two things just cancel with one another. And I've realized that it should be plus log theta here, rather than minus log theta. Apologies about that mistake as well. And then if we just work this out, we just get minus log of theta over one minus theta. I've combined the logs there because subtracting log of one minus theta is the same as dividing theta through by the argument one minus theta. So we've got minus the log odds of theta as being the derivative of our entropy. And we're looking for the condition when this is equal to zero. And log of something is equal to zero only if that argument is equal to one. So in other words, we've got theta over one minus theta is equal to one at the maximum. 
We would know it was a maximum if we took the second derivative, which would turn out to be negative, but just to save space here, I'm not going to do that. You're going to have to take my word for the, the fact it's a maximum. And what we obtain as the maximum value, or call it theta hat, is equal to a half. So we know that the function is maximized at theta being equal to a half, but what else does the function do? Well, we know that there should be symmetry here because intrinsically there's no real difference between the coin landing heads up versus tails up in terms of the entropy of the situation, the uncertainty. So there should be some symmetry around theta being equal to a half. And we also know that if the probability of the coin landing heads is certain, in other words, p of x equal to 1 equals 1, then in that circumstance, we're going to get zero out for our entropy because the first part of our entropy are one minus theta. This will just be zero, and meaning that the whole thing, the whole sort of first part of the expression is zero. And then also in the second half, we're gonna get log of one, which is also zero. So we'll get zero here as well. And similarly, we could apply the same reasoning and also get that the entropy is zero, at theta being equal to zero. And then if we sort of join these points up, our curve looks something like this. Okay, so what does this tell us? Well, if we take our first interpretation of entropy as a measure of uncertainty, then it makes perfect sense because when theta is equal to a half, in other words, we have a fair coin where it's equally likely that the coin will land heads up versus tails up, then that's the maximum amount of uncertainty we can have in the system. Whereas if say theta is equal to one, there is no uncertainty in the system because of the fact we know that the coin is always going to land heads up. Similarly for theta being equal to zero. And we can think about sort of any less extreme example as also being of less uncertainty, of lower uncertainty. Imagine we've got theta being equal to three quarters. In this case, there's less uncertainty because the majority of the time the coin is going to land heads up. We know that beforehand we are able to better predict what the outcome will be. And whenever you're able to better predict something, that means that you've got lower uncertainty. So the theta being equal to half maximizes the entropy, and that indicates why we can represent uncertainty using entropy. But what is the value of entropy at theta being equal to a half, and what does that mean? Well, if we substitute theta being a half into our formula here, what we actually get out here is minus a half log of a half minus a half log of a half for the example where theta is equal to a half and so we just get minus log a half which if you use your log rules is just equal to log of two because of the fact that log of one is zero and if we're using log to the base two then this gives us an entropy equal to one and so at our maximum value of entropy, the entropy is equal to one. But what does that mean? Well, the idea is essentially what this is measuring, because we've used to the base two here, is it's the number of binary bits that we need to use to represent the outcome of throwing that coin, not flipping that coin. And that makes perfect sense because the coin's got two outcomes and we can represent it as I've done here by zero and ones. In other words, I can just use one bit, which is either equal to zero or equal to one. And by a bit, just in case you're getting confused, it's just think of it as one single number, which is either zero or one. And so we can use one bit of information to represent the outcome of that coin. And so it makes sense that our maximum entropy is equal to one, or you can kind of think about that as being the reason why the maximum entropy is equal to one. But you might find that explanation a little bit lacking because, of course, any outcome of the coin, no matter what value of theta, can be represented by one bit. But what Shannon worked out was the idea that the information which is conveyed by one bit varies depending on the value of theta. When theta is equal to half, the entropy, the information of the result of that coin toss can be represented by one binary bit. That's the informational content. But if theta was equal to one, then there is no information in telling someone that result. There is no reduction in their uncertainty. Because if theta was equal to one, 
they, the person would know that the coin was always going to land heads up. And similarly, you can think about what would the reduction in uncertainty be if theta was some value between a half and one. So for example, three quarters. And although I've not drawn it very well here, which is why I'm sort of drawing the curve upwards slightly, if you go through and you plug in three quarters into the formula, you actually get an entropy value of about 0.56. So that sounds a bit confusing. I mean, how can we represent the outcome of a coin by sort of almost half a number? But that nonetheless is the result which Shannon's formula for information tells us. Essentially, even if we do encode the outcome of that coin in a binary bit, essentially we're only conveying 0.56 approximately bits of information to that person. So we've seen that the entropy is essentially a measure of information content of the outcome of some random process. But why do we choose this particular mathematical form for the entropy? Now I want to try and convey some of the mathematical intuition behind why we choose this particular form for entropy. So imagine now that we're considering the outcome of two random processes and we use the random variables x1 and x2 to represent the outcome of those two processes. If those two processes are independent of one another, in other words, the outcome of one does not tell you anything about the outcome of the other, then we would hope that the overall informational content of the system is equal to the information conveyed by knowing the first or the outcome of the first process plus the information conveyed by the outcome of the second process. In other words, entropy should be additive. And I stress that this is only in the independent case. If there was dependence between x1 and x2, then the amount of information conveyed by x1 tells you something about x2 and vice versa, and hence there is this kind of interdependence between the entropies, and it's not just simply going to be additive. So imagine now that we're talking about the outcome of two coin flips. So we just flip the coin twice and we're modeling the coin flipping action of the sort of second flip as being independent from that of the first or the outcome of that of the second is independent of that of the first. In this case, we can work out the overall entropy, the overall entropy of the system x1 and h of x1 and x2 is equal to minus the sum over both x1 and x2 of the joint distribution of p of x1 and x2 times the log of p of x1 and x2. And because the events are independent, we can rewrite this as the sum of x1, sum of x2 times, or sorry, summed over p of x1 times p of x2 times the log of p of x1 times p of x2. And we can rewrite this in turn as well as the sum over x1 and the sum over x2 of p of x1, p of x2 times the log of p of x1. And then we're gonna use the sort of additive form or additive log rule which gives us plus p of x1 times p of x2 times log of p of x2. And we notice that in the first expression, we've got two bits that only depend on, or two parts that only depend on x1, and we've got one part that depends on x2. So we can take the x1 parts out, and then we just be left with a sum of p of x2 over x2. But of course, if the marginal distribution of x2 is a valid probability distribution, which it will be, the sum of p of x2 is equal to one, which means that in this first part of the expression, we're just left with the minus one times the sum of x1 of p of x1 times log of p of x1. And we can make the exact same argument with the second part, we just get left with minus the sum over x2 of p of x2, the marginal distribution of x2, times log of p of x2. And of course, this first part here is just the entropy of x1, or technically including the minus sign, and then the second part including the minus sign is the entropy of x2, and hence the overall entropy 
for the case of independent random variables, x1 and x2, is just the sum of the individual entropies. Whilst I didn't really need the coin flip example to, to illustrate anything here, I think it just helps us to think about what the problem is and what x1 and x2 represent. So in summary, we've seen two interpretations of entropy. One of them is as a measure of uncertainty in a system. The other is as a measure of information content in the system. How much information would we need or how much information do we convey to someone by telling them the outcome of that random system? And finally, we've seen that it makes intuitive sense, this concept of entropy, for the case of having independent outcomes.